last week, you all looked at um, Doubting Thomas, if I'm not mistaken. And well, there was, that was the second appearance of, of Jesus after he resurrected. And so today I want to look at the third appearance um, after the resurrection. And um, so between this time and uh, Pentecost, I'm not really focusing on any particular theme. I just want to follow the sequence of events leading up to Pentecost. We'll uh, look at things in a little different order, uh, but we're, gonna, we're, we're leading up to Pentecost. And uh, one thing I do want to uh, emphasize in all of this uh, are the implications of the resurrection as we see um, after Christ has risen, see the effect that it's had on the church and those that were following him. Amen. And so uh, today we're in, we're looking at uh, Peter and the disciples going out fishing. It presents a bit of a dilemma because depending on how you understand uh, them going fishing, depending on if you say it's right or it's wrong, uh, that sort of dictates how the rest of the passage, how you interpret the rest of the passage. And so I, I started out one way and then got to the end of it, and then I was convicted. It spoke to me a bit, you know, and uh, I had to just, you know, do this thing that we have to do, and you just, you see something, the Word speaks to you, and you got to sort of change direction, you know, and go back the other way. I had to do that. And don't you just, you just hate it when that happens. When you read this word and it speaks to you, points to you, and it's like God is speaking directly to you. And you're like, I do that. I need to stop doing that. You know, that's just, it's the worst, but it's the best because it's sort of a, a bittersweet uh, feeling because you know, you're, you're getting rid of some baggage that you've been holding on to. And that's, that's what I went through. Uh, this past week. Very convicting passage for me. Uh, and so, like I said, today we're going to look at uh, this encounter uh, that the disciples have, mainly Peter, but these disciples, they have this encounter with Christ. This is the third time they've seen him after the resurrection. And so uh, it's written, after Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the sea of Galilee, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out fishing, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. And so like I said, there's two ways you can look at this. And there are those that look at this and say they were wrong. What were they thinking? What were they doing? They, they, they should have known God didn't, Jesus didn't say anything about going fishing. He told them to go wait for him in Galilee and there he'll meet them. But here they are, it's uh, the people they point out, they'd grown impatient and perhaps they were going back to the lifestyle that they left. They turned their back on the kingdom. They go as far as to say that uh, Peter, he, he turned his back on uh, the calling that God, had, that Jesus had called him to. And, and they were just, this is just wrong what they were doing. They had no business doing that. They, they weren't told to go. And so they, they, they were just in the wrong. And then there was others that'll say, well, there's nothing wrong with this. Um, they, they, they had to eat. You know, they, they had Peter, he had a family to feed. And so there was, they, they, they were obedient. Jesus told him to go back to Galilee and wait for him. And so they did that. And here they are. They, they just decided to go fishing while they're waiting on Jesus. It's nighttime. And so they probably didn't expect him to show up at night anyway. And so why not just go fishing, have some breakfast, uh, and be prepared for his arrival? And so um, I, I, I'm just being honest with you. I'm going to give you my, my bias in this. I'm biased towards this latter view because I like fishing. I, I like to go fishing. I, I, I don't think there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, I don't want to see that there's anything wrong with that because I don't think it's anything wrong with going out and just, you know, you're in nature and, you know, uh, you cast your, your, your line out and you're just waiting. You're connected with God. You feel the, you know, the breeze, the nature. You can really appreciate God's work in nature and all of that. And, and especially if you can think and picture yourself here with these disciples uh, it's nighttime, they're on this boat, it's dark, it's quiet. Everyone else has gone home, they're in their bed sleeping. 
and uh, you know you hear that, that feel that cool breeze. It's night, and that cool breeze is breezing past you, and uh, you hear the sound of the water splashing against the boat. That's just that's just the best. And on top of that, you're with your brothers or your sisters. They're with their brothers, and they're they're in this boat, and they're having some good fellowship. You know, uh, Peter's he's standing over there in his underwear, but no mind that. Um, <laughs> It's good fellowship, you know, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. We want to say that. And if you buy that, I got a bridge in Brooklyn, I'll sell you. Um, there's something wrong with this. And uh, as I tried to tell myself, there wasn't. And when I got to the end of this, I said, no, no, there's something wrong with this, you know. And you'll see it. You'll see it come out. But, you know, we, and we do this. We, we like to try and justify things when there's things that we do and we try to rationalize the, uh, it's, it's, it's reasonable. It's, it's a good thing, you know. We do things and we say, well, uh, I'm doing it for the Lord. You know, we spend all our time on Facebook and Instagram and playing the little games. We spend all our time glued to these screens and we go binge watching Netflix and, and we somehow try to justify it. These things that we do that distract us, that take away, that take our focus away from the kingdom. And uh, we justify, well, no, this is good stuff. It has, you know, I, I don't know what you say, but I know what I say. I know what I do. And so um, uh, we do that. We, we try to justify the things that we do and say that this is good stuff. This is kingdom work. And I, I see that this is uh, perhaps this is what Peter was running through his mind, that he was um, thinking to himself, there was nothing wrong with this. But you got to think about this. This is one thing I don't think we typically grasp in this passage. They're likely where this all began. If you recall, it was here in this Sea of Galilee where Jesus initially called them. They were fishing. Peter, he pulled his boat up and Jesus had gotten into his boat and told him to push out and he began to speak. And uh, uh, it was here that he told him, cast your net out again. And Peter said, I didn't catch anything all night, but because you said, I'll do it. And he caught this fish, that is, all these fish that his nets began to break. And then he called over his other partners and they came, the same uh, disciples that are here. And upon catching this great catch, they decided to follow Christ. Jesus told them right here and right there that uh, I'm going to make you fisher, fishers of men. And so they left everything, it says. They left everything, nets and all, and followed the Lord. And so here they are, right back where they started. I mean, it's not like today, you know, we have boats and uh, we get big trucks and we'll go and we'll attach them and pull them out of the water and go take them somewhere and keep them safe. They didn't have that back in those days. They typically just pulled the boat out onto the shore and just left it there. They had a certain spot for their boats and nobody wouldn't mess with them. That's how it is today in a lot of countries. And so they're most likely back where they were called, back where they left everything behind to follow Christ. And here they are going out fishing again. Do you see that? That It should start to wonder, I wonder what was going through their minds. This is a big, uh, this is a moment for them. Because again, they're like, wow, this has been maybe two years, two, three years since we've been here, since we've gone through this. And here we are back again, you know, and given the fact that they just experienced the resurrection of Christ. Something ought to have been different. Something ought to have changed their perspective on life and coming back to that place where it all began. It shouldn't have been, well, let's just go fishing. Something should have been a little different for them. And we'll see that. I mean, um, what they're doing, uh, it, it should have... There, there should have been a different reaction. And we do this. We, 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 I mean, I'm pretty sure that uh, if you can think back to when you first encountered Christ, um, after that initial encounter, things must have changed for you. 
you didn't continue doing the same things that you'd done before. Uh, perhaps the same friends that you had, you didn't have them anymore. Uh, some of the things that you enjoyed doing, you realized that this didn't quite coincide with this new walk that you were uh, endeavoring upon. You, you had a, a, an encounter with Christ and your direction in life turned towards the kingdom. You t changed directions. And so coming back to where you left off, you, it doesn't really make much sense to go back the same way you came. You know, there ought to be a different direction when we, uh, after we have this, this encounter with Christ. But like I said, we like to justify things. We like to bring things that we used to do and justify them. Well, I'll do it for the Lord. Um, uh, I'll, uh, however we try to rationalize it, we do. I've done it. Well, it, God made this, and so he put it here for me, and so I can indulge in it if I just temper myself. Or, you know, it's nothing wrong with going out and doing these things and whatever else we do. Um, we, we try and justify doing them. And um, they're not kingdom-oriented. They have nothing, they have no effect on uh, the kingdom. And I'll give you a little, a little spiritual hack to follow. If, if whatever it is you're doing, if you're questioning it, if Jesus were to show up and you'd be ashamed, you know, you, you know how you, you're, you're looking at something on your web browser and someone comes in and quickly you X out of it or uh, you come in, you get startled, someone startles you to catch you doing something and you quickly shuffle it away. Uh, if, if Jesus were to come in and uh, see you doing whatever it is you're doing and you felt ashamed. If you did a shuffle, if you closed something out, if you ran away, then it's probably uh, not kingdom oriented. Amen. But we do this. Verse 4, it reads, it says, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Now, because this is the book of John, uh, we are always looking for deeper implications. This is just how he writes. Whenever he uh, explains a scene, he's setting things up for us to see uh, deeper implications, deeper theological implications. And so there's a lot of ink that's been spilled over this and what this could mean, uh, this, this great fish, uh, this great catch of fish, all of the casting the net on the other side of the boat. Some will say that it speaks to um, the mission him sending them out now to the Gentiles, that they are going to uh, now go out to these Gentiles and they're going to catch, uh, bring a, a great catch of Gentiles into uh, the kingdom. And others look at this and see this as sort of a, a reinstatement since it is right back where they began. And it's sort of following very, if you read this passage, I think in Luke, uh, it, it follows very similarly to how they first encountered Christ. And so a lot of, a lot of people will say, well, he's reinstating them uh, to their uh, commitment to follow them. That makes sense. Uh, and others say that he's reminding them uh, of th their initial decision to follow him. Here they are, they're going through the same rigmarole that they went through when they first met him, and here they are, they are and they're sort of being reminded that uh, you decided to follow Christ. You decided to leave this life behind and follow him. And so I, I don't know about you, but that, that speaks to me. Um, because before I had my encounter with Christ, before I gave my life to Christ, I had my own agenda. I had my own ambitions, all the things that I wanted to do it had nothing to do with the kingdom, you know, uh, things that I wanted to accomplish, you know, uh, things I wanted to say, look, I did that. I, I accomplished that. But again, nothing to do with the kingdom. And when I had that encounter with Christ, that direction changed. It, it, it's, it, it's a crossroad, you know, when you encounter Christ, your life takes a turn to the kingdom. 
And so the things that I enjoyed, the things that I was endeavoring to do, the, the things I wanted to accomplish, I realized they had nothing to do with this new walk that I was walking on. Um, the things that I just so wanted to accomplish, they didn't seem reasonable anymore. They seemed rather foolish. Why, why was I thinking that? Why was I wanting to pursue that? It has no eternal significance. Nothing that I was doing was going to come about or have any everlasting, any, any lasting effect on, on the kingdom. And so uh, I see this as a reminder for these disciples that they decided to leave this life behind and follow Christ. And we need that from time to time. We need to be reminded that uh, this world, the world that we left behind, it no longer coincides with this kingdom journey. Uh, the things that we realized before, uh, well, I need to put that away. We need to leave them put away. We don't need to bring them back and try to justify, well, if I just do it a little bit, just a little bit, if I engage in this, just, you know, it's, it's just harmless. You know, just a little game on, uh, uh, that I'm playing on my phone, a little bejeweled. We like to play these little games. And then, uh, you know, what turned from uh, five minutes, we turn into an hour. And then you look at your, how, how, how many hours you've spent staring at your phone. You've spent several hours doing nothing. Wasted time when there's kingdom work to be done. Like I said, when we encounter Christ, when we take our lives, take a turn for the kingdom, it ought to change our perspective on things. When we come back and we revisit some of the places uh, that we've been and where we've come from, we ought not come back and then go back into the same thing that we left behind. It's a waste of time. And this is what I see happening in this passage. They're being reminded of the life that they left behind. And, and their pursuit of eternal things is much more profitable. Um, in verse 7 it reads, Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and he jumped in the water. And I, I think Peter, he knew in his heart that what he was doing was wrong. He, 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 like I said, when he, he knew, realized it was Christ. He's standing there in his underwear. He's got, he's got, he got caught with his pants down, literally. Uh, what did he do? He, 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 it was his idea. He said, let's go fishing. And everybody came with him. And so he leaves them behind. He jumps in the water and swims to Christ. He leaves them behind. Uh, I believe he was ashamed. I believe he, for whatever reason, he realized what he was doing was wrong. You know, and he didn't want to be seen doing that. So he puts his clothes back on and jumps into the water and, and swims to Christ. It says, the other disciples followed in the boat, towing their net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Again, uh, a lot of theologians, they'll point to some of the deeper implications of this, and some will point out that perhaps he's saying that uh, not to leave those that, that catch behind. If we're looking at this in terms of him sending them out, their future ministry of going out to the Gentiles, he's saying, No, I've incorporated them into the kingdom as well. Bring those along uh, with us, with you. Um, the one thing I don't think we uh, sort of grasp here, I mean, I think that, you know, the fact that. Um, Jesus is on the shore, he's on the beach, and he has this fire going, and he's got fish and bread, fish and chips on the beach. Uh, we think, kind of think he just kind of snapped his fingers, and, and it just, poof, appeared. But uh, I, I can imagine, I just try to imagine what this would have been like. He's probably gotten there, and he's right there, there 100 yards away, and he's just listening to them the whole time. And they didn't catch anything that night. And so you can imagine the frustration of them casting the, the nets. And, and Peter, you know, he's just fussing at everybody, and, and, and he's just having a good laugh at them. And here he is, he's got, he's got his fish. He, I don't know how he caught them. He may have had a, just called them, come on in. 
and, and put these fish on the fire and he's got this fire going and he's got some coals and, and he's just sitting there just listening to his disciples perhaps. Uh, just fussing. And then uh, when they, it's light enough for them to see him, he calls out to them, y'all haven't caught anything yet? And, and then they realize, he says, well, just throw it on the other side. And, and, and so I, I just see him having a good laugh at their expense. Uh, he's like, oh, that's, bless their hearts. That's just cute. Y'all got skills? Yeah. <laughs> but this is, this is all that he's showing them, you know, with all that they're going through, I, I see this as intentional. He's allowing them to go through this because they may not get it now, but one day as they're getting deeper into this ministry, and they will, and they did, uh, they're going to realize what Jesus has been saying to them all along. And uh, I see this in this text, and we can grasp something from that because how often have uh, you realized that God is speaking to you? He said something to you. And you hear him loud and clear. And then when you get to thinking about it, you think back, well, he's been saying this all along. And, and not just the last couple of weeks, but years. He's been pointing and putting little breadcrumbs and showing you the same thing that you just realized now. He's been showing it to you all along. And I think he does that so that way you can't say, well, this is just a coincidence. I need to think on this a little more. I need to pray on it a little more. But no, he's showing you, no, I've been saying it to you from way back in the beginning, but you're just now getting it. You know, and we like to think of ourselves as, um, as people of knowledge. You know, we can quote a little scripture. We, we understand a little theology and, and we Think highly of ourselves. And when you have this humbling experience like this, that God has been trying to teach you this simple lesson for years and you're just now getting it, it's rather uh, humbling. It's a humbling experience. I, I can attest to that. It's, it's humbling. Um, but I see that th they're going to learn this lesson. In verse 11, it says, So Simon Peter, he climbed back into the boat and dragged, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 but even with so many fish, the net was not torn. Uh, a lot of people will, will, well, I'll get to that. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And so... A lot of, th th there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of crazy stuff out there trying to explain this 153 uh, fish. And they're like, why, how did that happen? You know, how, how, why did they count exactly 153 fish? Why does he take note of that? You know, and there's throughout, since the beginning of the church, we've been trying to explain that. There's all kinds of mathematical equations that we've come up with, the square root of this, and it just, it's not worth it. Uh, I'll tell you that all that they come up with, what it all points to, it all points to the same thing in one way or another. It all points to the inclusion of Gentiles into the kingdom, that there will be no more Gentile. It'll be Jew and Gentile, but we'll all be children of God together with God. All of their conclusions point to that. And we already know that. And so if you want to go and try and come up with some kind of equation to figure that out, have at it. But that's what all they come up with. That, yes. It, it, <laughs> amen. But like I said, I, I, I see this as uh, Jesus. He's just having a good laugh at these disciples at their expense. And uh, he knew that this is what they were going to do. He knew when he told them that I'd meet you in Galilee, they were going to come back to that spot. He knew that. He knew that they were going to, at some point in time, they were going to go fishing again. He knew they weren't going to catch anything. He knew this. He knew that Peter would jump out and, and just to, uh, swim to him out of breath and then climb back in the boat and bring the fish. He knew all of this was going to happen. He knew that he'd gonna, he was going to prepare breakfast for him. He knew this. And like I said, he's, he's allowed all of this to take place to teach them this lesson that everything that they're looking for, everything they need, they'll find it in him. All the work that they did, all that they was trying to do, if they would, all Jesus says when he gives the command, just cast your net on the other side. That's when they caught 
caught that, uh, that big haul of fish. Jesus will provide all that they would ever need. But he knew this. He knew this. But take notice of one thing, that uh, despite them going out and getting into whatever, whether you want to think of it as being right or wrong, look at Jesus' response. He doesn't shame them. He doesn't chastise them. He, he, he calls out to them children. This word, padion, uh, it, it, literally it is children, but it's a, um, a term of endearment. And, and so the NIV captures that in calling them friends. He calls them friends. Friends, come on in. Come on in and have some breakfast. Bring what you've caught or what I've caught. I, I caught it for you. I just told you, you just hauled it in. He's not there ready to uh, just cast a, a fire and brimstone upon them. Because he knew, he knew that they would take this direction. And that's the same as with us. We're going to mess up at times. We get caught up into things. We waste our time. We go back the way that we came and, and get caught up in some of the stuff that we left behind. But Jesus isn't there. God isn't there to to condemn you. He calls you friend. Friend, come on in. I'll give you everything that you need and more, more than you can ever imagine. He's there to comfort them. He's there to encourage them. He's there to tell them, come on in. Come on in. I'm here. Let's have breakfast together, to fellowship together. And so we need to remember that, that God isn't here to don't feel so ashamed because God isn't here to, to just to, to write you off, to, to cast you out, to, to condemn you when you've fallen astray. Because we do that from time to time. And when we realize it, we have that opportunity to do that turn, to turn and repent and turn back to him. He's gracious. He's loving. And he wants us to fellowship with him. He, he's, that's, this is the God that we serve. He's a good, loving God. Doesn't want to, doesn't desire that we perish. You know, a lot of people look at this and then you hear a lot of preachers preach on this and it's just fire and brimstone. How dare they? They should have known better. You can't do that. But God, he calls them friend. Come on in. I have breakfast already waiting for you. Who does that? Our God. Our God. When we fall astray, he's ready to meet us and, and treat us, serve us. And call us friend. This is the God that we serve. And so don't beat yourself up. If you realize that you, you waste a lot of time doing what absolutely amounts to nothing. You, you get caught up in what the world is doing and whatever it may be. Uh, just know when you realize that you have that opportunity to turn back to the kingdom. And God is there. He's ready to welcome you with open arms. Come on in, friend. Come on. The water is fine. Amen? Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this word and this reminder that uh, all of those that have had an encounter with Christ, all of those that have turned their life towards the kingdom, uh, we need to be focused on the kingdom. Uh, all the things that are irrelevant, all the things that have nothing to do with anything, uh, we can leave that in the life that we left behind and turn and look to you. And so we just say thank you. Thank you that we do this at times and yet you are merciful, you are forgiving and, and you just welcome us back uh, to, to follow you. And so Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for this reminder and I pray this word it fall not upon deaf ears but that we uh, remember it and, and let it seep into our hearts. And so Lord, we give, give you praise this day and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.